It's really, you know, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ken Anderson, the president of Mountain USA. Ken and I have known each other for at least 15 years. You're going to date us, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, that's all right. So we have a lot of history and heritage together, and, you know. So um, Ken was, a, was a vice president at Cosworth, which is a name that I'm sure everyone really knows. Very, very historic brand. You know, one very much associated with Lotus as well. And so Mountain is a very similar company in that they do very high level work and a lot of focus on Ford. But Ken mm -hmm. is an absolute Lotus fanatic and passionate about Lotuses. In fact, part of what he does do at Mountain is similar to what we are doing, and that is restoring cars um, and the older cars, building engines. So without further ado, let me, let me uh, <laughs> hand the floor over to Ken right. Anderson, president of Mountain. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, 15, maybe it's 16 years, Shanu, I'm not sure, but it's been a while. Yeah. Good times, though. Um, always dealing with uh, engine projects and that. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, as Shunu said, uh, Mountain is uh, very similar to Cosworth in regards. In fact, most of us at Mountain USA used to work at Cosworth. Uh, and when Cosworth closed the U.S. branch, when Chapcar left and, and uh, we were building IndyCar engines, Formula Atlantic, uh, I started Mountain, and Mountain was originally started in England, Essex, England, in 1980 by David Mountain, hence the name Mountain, and um, had been known as a Ford uh, engine builder, so Ford four-cylinder turbos for touring cars, rally cars, and um, all through the, the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, so names like Colin McRae, uh, Carlos Sainz used Mountain engines, <clears throat> and Mountain, of course, still exists in the in the UK, and uh, they do British touring car engines, um, rallycross engines. In the USA, uh, I started Mountain in about 2013. Met up with David Mountain at a, a event in England, and he said we want to be in the USA, and I said I speak British, so let's do it. So we started the US side, and we have a facility in Carson, uh, which is near Long Beach. In case you don't know, it's. Uh, uh, we have a, a full engine f uh, design and development facility and build facility, so engine dynos, uh, uh, machining in-house, assembly, um, uh, and then we also have a branch of the, the company that does performance engineering. So we make, we're, we're really known in, this, in the States for our performance parts for uh, the Ford EcoBoost line of vehicles like the Focus RS, Focus ST, Ranger, Raptor. Uh, but motorsports is a big part of our business and growing. We do all of Honda's uh, for Honda racing development. We do all of their Formula 3 and Formula 4 engines. So that's about 200 engines a year. So it's the, the Leger chassis. It's, they're like small Indy cars. Um, and we do the track support. We do things like uh, win Pikes Peak overall with a, an engine uh, that we just built. And uh, that's a Honda K20, uh, about 750 horsepower. So we, we do quite a bit of uh, engine work, and uh, I guess a couple years ago, Chenu approached us about working with the 2ZZ again, and we already uh, inherently had a lot of experience with this engine from the Cosworth days because we did a lot of development, I guess probably about 15 years, 10 years ago, something like that, we were doing parts for it. Um, so we knew a lot about the engine, we'd run, we'd, we'd run uh, a lot of analysis on it and looked for failure points and things like that that we could improve on. And so uh, that's what I really wanted to talk about today is, is the 2ZZ since many of, you, many of you have these engines in your Elise and Exige. And uh, it's, uh, as you know, it's made by Toyota, a 1.8 liter. And um, so some of the things we've found over time that are weak areas in it is it, when, when you have this engine with a lot of miles on it, the cylinder bores aren't traditional iron, uh, they're a metal matrix, and which that is a, a process that Toyota developed where the, the block is actually molded with an improved uh, blend of aluminum and other types of metal around the bore. Usually engines have like a cast iron bore, so you have um, the ability to bore and hone it. You can't do that with the 2ZZ, so we actually, on the rebuild process, we found is, is a way to machine this out and put these inserts in to give it a longer life and more stability and um, a better sealing uh, option on the, on the piston rings. So when we go through these engines, we completely disassemble them and inspect them 
and look for issues uh, that may cause future problems like excessive wear in the main bearing tunnel, uh, the cylinder bores may be out of shape or the deck may be warped and sometimes the blocks get rejected as she knew knows but uh, if, they're, if they're in uh, rebuildable condition which uh, most of the time they are, they're, they're cleaned in a vapor blasting process which makes them look virtually new so this block has I don't know, this block's probably 15 years old, 20 years old, and it looks, it looks to be in good shape. Uh, so the cleaning process uses a high pressure water and a soft media, and it, and it cleans it quite well. We also remove all of the plugs that are in the oil galleys, which are actually, Toyota presses in a big ball bearing, and we pull it out and thread, drill and thread the, uh, the, the port where we can put a nice removable plug in for later servicing if you need to rebuild the engine. Um, one thing we see on these engines a lot of times is excessive camshaft wear um, <clears throat> and that is probably an oiling issue caused by either low oiling or oil starvation in corners which is really a reason why you should be using Chinoo's baffled oil pan. I'm not sure your exact name for it but the G yeah the G-Pan 3 is featured here on this picture um, and that's going to help prevent issues like that. Um, so once the block is inspected and cleaned and uh, we start uh, the uh, machining process and we again do this in-house on our we have a CNC machine that's programmed to do it and we'll machine out these bores and um, this one already has the sleeves installed but you would just be solid aluminum right here and we plunge cut it down in and to the right size the block is heated up to about 150 degrees and then these are pressed in in a hydraulic press and locked in with an anaerobic, anaerobic thread lock which is like Loctite and set overnight with a press on top of it. Um, we've never had any issues with them coming out. Uh, they're also clamped in with the cylinder head when, it, when that's in place. Uh, then it's, it's also machined for valve relief. If you've ever seen uh, a 2ZZ block, the valves which is kind of unusual, the, the intake and exhaust valves would hit the, the block if it wasn't machined. So you can see these, you can look at it later, but you can see we machined it out for valve clearance. Um, and that, that gives us a great foundation uh, to build an engine on that, you know, is going to last a lot longer than the original setup and would be, uh, be able to be rebuilt at a future uh, date because, again, with an iron liner, you can go through and bore and hone it to, the, to a larger size uh, piston should you have bore wear if you're you know, excessively revving it on the track or anything like that. Uh, I didn't bring a cylinder head but we also do the same type of process to the cylinder head. We remove all of the pressed in plugs, drill and tap it for removable plugs. Uh, it's clean, processed, we do uh, what we call a, po a pocket port or a, a cleanup of the port, which is right behind the valves, uh, increases the airflow about 7%. Not a lot, but it's already an efficient cylinder head. Um, so there's, there's not a huge amount of improvement um, that you'd really want to do anyways if you're keeping your stock ECU tune and stock camshafts. So it really optimizes the engine and, and, and keeps it within its original design uh, criteria. Um, we use uh, a new one, uh, which is a, a CNC valve seat cutter, so it gives you a very precise valve seat. Unlike the old days where they used a stone to actually grind the valve seats, um, this is a, a multi-point cutter and it comes in and it locates on the valve guide. And sorry if I'm a little bit t too technical for you, but um, you can probably look some of this up later on, but it really gives a nice uh, a valve job. Um, and then everything is surfaced to the spec that allows a uh, multi-layer steel head gasket to seal correctly. That's one thing we see a lot of other engine builders do. They have older machinery and it's essential to keep these surfaces uh, to a mirror-like finish, otherwise the modern head gaskets won't seal correctly. Um, so th then, that's, and then it's assembled with upgraded valve springs and this is one of the requests that Chenu made. He said that the uh, if customers are rev, uh, you know, revving their engines to uh, maximum uh, RPM, uh, it'd be great to upgrade it. So we've, uh, we include a, a upgraded valve springs, so that kind of future-proofs the engine. Once it's uh, ready to assemble, we go through and do a complete blueprint assembly on it. 
uh, which that includes uh, checking all of the clearances, setting them to our standards that we've developed over the years, which would be precise ring gaps, uh, bearing clearances, deck height, that's when the piston comes out of the, um, the top of the block. You want to make sure that's correct so you have proper head gasket sealing. We also use Molle 4032 pistons, and there's what that means is it's an alloy that's suitable for street driving and also um, high performance use, supercharged use. It's a forged piston, very lightweight, very durable. It has a graphol coating on it, which is great for startup on cold engines. So it means less wear. So this is a, a much improved piston over the original piston and should last a lifetime really. And that's, that's one of the big upgrades on these engines. And it keeps it quiet, too. Uh, one of the, the, um, the, the comments I've had from Chinoo and other people is that these engines feel quiet and smooth compared to the factory Toyota engine. And part of that is the piston, but it really a big part of it is the balancing technique we use. And uh, as you know, you have a, a crankshaft in there that's going to be spinning in upwards of 7,500, 8,000 RPM. So it's essential that it's balanced. And that when I say balanced, that means you have the connecting rods, you have the crankshaft, you have the pistons. Everything has to be uh, within a, a, a certain uh, range of tolerance. And if you have, um, if, if that is out of uh, balance, you're going to get uh, a vibration in the engine. And something you may not really feel, but what that vibration does is that absorbs power, or I'm sorry, it consumes power. Um, and so when you have something that's uh, more balanced, it's basically adding free power because it, the power is not robbed uh, with, with, the, uh, with any vibration. So we balance everything within a half a gram. Factory standards are 10 grams. So a half a gram is Formula One standard. And that's a big, um, that's a big upgrade, really, when you consider the, the, the benefit you get from it. It it's, uh, doesn't really take you any longer to do it correctly, so you should do it correctly. Um, and, and that's one of the, the, the techniques we use to help bring these two ZZs up to, I think, the standard that they should have been from the factory. We also use the factory connecting rods because they're good rods. They're forged, but we replace the rod bolts with ARP 2000s, which are stronger. Um, and again, they can be reused uh, at a later rebuild. We also uh, change the oil pump, which is a big issue on the two ZZs. Um, so it's a better gear, a stronger gear. You won't have gear failures in the, in the oil pump. Um, and then also, again, with the oil pan that we mentioned earlier. So these are all some of the just basic features um, that, that we do on these rebuilds for the two ZZs. And I think when you see um, the longevity that they bring to, to such a classic car, I, I think you'll find that it's worth it. Um, one of the things we've seen over time with the two ZZ, as I mentioned earlier, was camshaft where we're, we're testing, we have a device called a Spintron, and what that does is it basically mimics the valve train rotation and we're trying to find out why these cams are um, wearing and what we can do to minimize the wear and part of that may be a, a surface treatment called WPC and so we've seen some good results with that. I was going to talk to you about that. It's something we can add to the, to the builds um, once we've proven um, the concept. But I think it's, it's, we feel that, and I know Chanu does too as well, that the that platform, uh, the 2ZZ in the Exige and Elise, is going to be around, and they're classic cars. So our goal is to optimize these engines and bring life into them and keep, keep them on the track and then on the roads for as long as possible. Um, and it's, it's really about proper engineering and experience. We do some, a lot of the techniques we do uh, use on these builds or would be the same as what we do in high-level racing engines. Really, the biggest difference is just some of the component quality um, may not be quite the full racing spec, but the techniques to build them sh certainly is. So, any questions on that? Mm -hmm. On the sleeves, can you uh, can you opt to displace that? No, because the bore centers are too close. You can't. There's not enough room between the cylinders to increase yeah. the bore size. Yeah. yeah, the heat is part of the issue, but when this is machined out, it's still very thin. So there really isn't, you might be able to get a, a quarter of a millimeter, but it's not worth doing. No. 
So I see some people put uh, a longer stroke crank out of a 1ZZ and change the rod, but it's, I, I don't know that it would be beneficial. I would rather not yeah. try to reinvent the wheel in that regards. Mm -hmm. What's the useful life of the stock motor? Well, I think that depends on you, the owners. So the biggest thing, one of the things I want to talk about is warming these engines up before you drive them in anger on the track on the Ortega Highway, up Palomar. So you need to make sure the oil is at operating temperature. And what we see on the dyno, that can take as long as seven to 10 minutes. To, and yeah, you'd be surprised. And cold oil is a big part of the wear. That's why you see coatings on the pistons. I mean, that does help some of it, but that doesn't, that doesn't help your bearings or the camshaft. And so you want the oils to be up to operating temperature so the the uh, viscosity indexes work. You, you know, you have esters in the oil that need to be at a certain temperature so you have proper lubrication. So that is probably the biggest thing. This isn't in your Corolla and you're not going to Starbucks. It's a performance car. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great car. You want to keep it forever. Please warm them up. 10 minutes, you know, before you're, you're you're taking it, you know, past 5,000 RPM or something. You need to, you need to make sure the oil is at proper operating temperature. And I don't know, did those cars? They don't have an oil temp, do they, Gage? They don't. They no. Don't. So there's, there's something a little bit misleading. I mean, there's coolant temp. Yeah. And then Difference. you see, once you hit, you know, the coolant temp that they've got as a threshold, then you can you can actually rev into the second cam. Uh -huh. So it's a bit deceiving because in the early <clears throat> days we thought, oh, fantastic, yeah. you know, time to have fun. You know, once yeah. the water temp comes up, right? and then we start hammering into the second cam. Mm -hmm. But the oil temp still is lagging. Yeah. So just as Ken is saying, oil temp is a, a significant issue with, with wear on, on these cars. It's a big, it's a big issue, and, and, um, and, and testing again on the engine dyno, we see coolant temps come up pretty fast, three to five minutes. Oil temp takes a lot longer, and uh, so you wanna, even if you're just sitting there, you know, let it warm up, especially before any track days. Uh, but once, if you're doing that, there's no reason why these shouldn't last 100,000 miles plus, even if you're driving them aggressively, uh, especially after they're rebuilt with the um, quality parts. We also use, you know, uh, a steel-backed uh, multi-layer uh, uh, bearing that's a bit better than the factory bearings. But um, I would say it's the care and feeding of these engines that's a big part of it as well. Just answer one of my questions, and that is 100,000 miles realistic on normal driving. Yeah. And the cost of a rebuild? Uh, that depends on uh, the typical level that we're talking about here is usually about $11,000. So that would be on a, a retail level. And, and uh, so that's, you know, your forged pistons, all the machine work, the prepared head. What oil spec do you recommend running? Everybody uses. Everyone, yeah, everyone has their favorite. We, we use a lot of Motul oil, uh, track day stuff, 300 Vs, you know, 0, 0 020s, 0 050s, 550s, something like that. Um, street, same thing. I mean, I would use, uh, these engines can get away with a lighter oil if in, in our climate here because it's warm. If you live in a colder climate, um, you'd, you'd want to consider that. But, uh, yeah, I mean. So here on street, what would you, what do you think? Is uh, I like 1060 a lot on street, on these types, on newer engines. So you have a wide range and it's, um, it, you know, it depends on how often you're gonna change it. On an engine like this, 5,000 miles max, which isn't a lot because unless you're commuting in the car, which I don't know that too many people are. You're, you spoke about the considerations with warm-ups. Mm -hmm. What about on shutdown? Do you want to consider that also? Is it a time frame for that? Well, I don't know that there's an exact time frame, but I think if you were doing a track day or something and you didn't, you, you want to let it cool off a little bit. Um, I don't know that there's a prescribed time, but um, I, I wouldn't just come in and shut it off. If everything's running normally and it hasn't overheated, I would let it just sit there for probably 30, 40 seconds, something like that, and be fine. But I think warm-up is more critical than anything, especially oil temps.
an original come with 190 horsepower. So after you do your thing with the rebuild, is it just <coughs> So we're seeing about five horsepower extra on a blueprinted engine, no other changes. So, and that's the, the biggest request we get are um, stock compression ratio, stock camshafts, because it's already a pretty good power plant for, the, for a lightweight car. So anything else you're going to do is going to require tuning. So, and that could be an issue for you as well, especially in California. Sir. Um, the ultimate balancing is that the dynamic balancing with flywheel with clutch cover plate, or is that just We do, yeah, no, we do the pulleys, the crank, the flywheel, the clutch cover, everything. Rods, pistons, anything attached to the rotating assembly, the cam bell drive. We don't do the oil pump gear, but it floats in its own housing, so I don't think it's critical. No modifications to the intake manifold? Nope. We haven't done it. That's internally balanced, right? Mm hmm okay. Do you lighten the crankshaft? Nope. And when you do the valve job, do you put new seats in or do you just... If the head requires new seats and guides, we do, but we haven't uh, seen too many that do. Uh, typically, if the head is that worn, there are far other issues. The cam journals could be worn out, so the head is replaced. Um, valves and seats. Uh, Valves are usually reusable. Um, seats just need a valve job. And we'll cut the valve as well the val and put a multi-angle uh, valve job on it. Three? Three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as I mentioned earlier, upgraded springs, which can help on mechanical over revs if you miss a shift, and <laughs> which can happen. Does but. that allow you to increase red line at all? I mean, I know that's harder in DC. Oh, I suppose you probably could, but I, it's not really why we're doing it. It's just for better valve control. Most of the valve springs in modern engines from the factory are very lightweight uh, because valve springs cause parasitic loss. They, it takes horsepower to open them, and they're trying to get the most efficient engine they can. So uh, probably, you know, the 2ZZ wasn't really developed for Lotus, it was developed for a Corolla, so it's fortunate that it's a great engine, but uh, I think, you know, if it was designed as a sports car engine, these were some of the, some of the upgrades that it should have had or some of the design features it would have had right out of the factory. So we also, I don't, you know, to expand, since this is more of a Lotus crowd, we also do a lot of Lotus twin cams, which is, you know, in the Elons, the Europas, I and mean, we probably build 20 to 30 of those a year and uh, in all different flavors, racing engines, street engines, so quite a few of those from 105 horsepower to 190 horsepower. But big fan of the Lotus program. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think of the underdrive pulleys for the water pump? And, uh, so if it's a track car, it's probably okay if you're seeing any cavitation on the water pump um, or any cooling issues, but um, I'm not aware of any on that. I mean, it's, have you seen that? Any ca water just in cavitation in the in the? No, we haven't seen a cavitation issue, but cooling is certainly a problem on yeah. the car because the radiator position is, is, sure. is not, you know, it's not ideal. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, we haven't, we haven't tried it, but it's worth looking at because there's certainly a lot of other engines uh, that we do change the water pump pulley on, uh, and that would be like the Ford Duratec is a really great example. Uh, it developed for Caterham, you know, we w were changing the water pump speed because it, it was, it was um, designed for low RPM from the factory, so it was, it was cavitating, meaning that it was just sucking air at some point, not water. But it's something you can look at. I mean, it, I'd be curious if that couldn't, wouldn't help. I haven't touched the alternator, though. Usually alternators are, they're fine. So, yes, sir. Yeah, we're building a Lotus Twin Cam right now. Mm -hmm. Close to our variation, what would be the best way to get around there? Uh, Backling? Uh, so what is it in? Our uh, Evo. Okay, so it's a front bowl sump, a baffled sump. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, or a dry sump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Expensive, yeah. Right? yeah. A uh, baffled sump is probably the best thing to do, yeah, 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 it helps a lot, and as you know, they, they, there's big oil starvation problems with those um, production-based engines like that. But you see that uh, Europa that we restored can <coughs> rebuild the motor, yeah, yeah, yeah. you saw that car. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty good, huh? <laughs> is that car around here still?
Yeah, yeah, it's up in the central coast. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, you know, you can talk about engines. One of the things that we see is that there's a lot of misinformation about engines. And everybody in the world wants 500 horsepower on 91 octane gas in a four cylinder, you know, because somebody on the internet has, or, or YouTube has done it. And it, sure, it's cool if you want to run ethanol and, you know, things like that. But, and we certainly have some cars with turbos that make that power. But in a production based engine like this, in a car like the Elise or the Exige, I mean, there's a certain limit that you want to adhere to to keep the vehicle enjoyable and drivable for everyday usage. And, and I think on the typical build that, that Chinu helped us develop, that we came up with it, you know, with the feedback from customers, is it's something that's an enjoyable engine that gives you a little bit more uh, power. It's optimized, it's more efficient, and it's quieter, it's smoother, and it's, it's just a really good package for well balanced for a Lotus. Um, you know, Lotuses have never really been about having the maximum horsepower. It's all been, been about a, a fine balance. And those are the questions we get. Well, I want, you know, 400 horsepower. Well, okay, but it's not going to be a fun car. And that's true with many cars you see. I mean, you see uh, customers coming in and you have to say, well, it's, it's um, you can do that, but it's, you know, then you have to upgrade the transmission and many other components to go with it. So when you're considering an engine build, you want to consider it's the usage, the 95% of the time you're going to use it, which is driving in a canyon on a track, not drag racing. Uh, and so it's important to keep that in mind when you're thinking about an engine that you want for your car. You want it to be reliable, you want it to be usable, and not something that you're going to have to maintain on a daily basis because it's stressing out everything else in the vehicle and in the, in the car. This type of build, it's, it, you're going through, it's, it's something that enhances the entire vehicle. You know, it's all around improvement and the drivability is enjoyed. And I assume you have, there's a core exchange with your build, right? Yeah, we usually rebuild the customer's engine because it's a, it's a known entity at that point because it was running, maybe the head gasket went, you know, you know the problem that had, or it's just time to rebuild it. Second part is what's your what's your build time these days? Uh, on two ZZs, we can get them done in about a month. Um, we have a pretty good. We keep parts for all of these, so we have pistons, rod, uh, bolts, the 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 uh, all the components, the bearings. So it's not an issue. So final question is: Do you do any bench testing on? We do. Yeah, uh, we we can uh, dyno the engines or we whatever we want to do. It depends on the, the circumstances. So. We have a super flow engine test cell, so that can go up to 1,500 horsepower and 12,000 RPM so far. And it uh, has lap uh, track simulation on it, so we can put in Laguna Seca or VIR and test it, you know, whatever you want. But um, yeah, it's, it's uh, when we did the development on these a few years ago, um, you learn a lot. You, you learn the things that need to be repa uh, replaced or upgraded. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. You know? So it's, uh, this is not the end all, the highest power 2ZZ build that we're talking about today, but it's something that's very usable. And I think that most people would find it probably practical for their needs. Mm -hmm. Jumping to the twin cam for a second. Um, so what, what do you think of the Ford Motorsport block as a, a rebuild block? I use them all the time. Okay. I have six of them in stock right now. I just got back in. I think it's an amazing block. Yeah, I had a motor build of one. It seemed to be a, you know, decent for yeah. what the opinion was. Now, on the head side of things, um, is there anything making a, a decent head casting to solve for us? The issue? There, there's three companies that make heads for twin cams now. So, yeah. Yeah, we use the one out of England, um, SAS, and uh, it's a great casting. Uh, the QED has one, we've used those. Um, it looks fine. The, Q, the SAS is, uh, I think, a bit geared more towards the racer. Um, they're all modern alloys, LM25, so it's, it's a, a lot better than the fact. That's the biggest thing is, too, on the twin cams is we, we'll get one in and it, I, I just cringe at pulling the head off because they're always cracked between the spark plugs. And you have to make that call, I'm sorry, it's gonna be $5,000 for a head because the heads are $5,000. And it's, it's, uh, it's a bit tough, but yeah. You would, you would weld the head. I wouldn't touch it. 
It's, you'll, you'll spend more money welding the head, machining it back than it is at, at today's labor rate. It's not worth it. And then you still have, you still have a welded head. <laughs> so yeah, a twin cam, no head build or no head replacement starts at about 11,000 rebuild and then on up from there. So full race engines about 25,000 dry sump, all new. So you guys tune the two cans with the rubber heads all day long. Really? Yep. You guys are oh, I use rubber heads or you guys are looking to be uh, I, don't, I haven't done, I mean, we've done a few Stromberg engines, but usually they're not really require any tuning because they're more to a stock build, but racing engines uh, and, and performance engines, we, we, we as Shinu mentioned, we, we have a couple of lawns in right now. One of them has a, a build we just finished, 155 horsepower, 1760 twin cam on dual 40s. Um, st basically a stock head, a big valve head, you know, the old big valve head, but with a 420 lift cam. Um, 10 to 1 compression, nice engine. So you guys can actually tune the uh, weapons so the uh, Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, they laugh at me because I'm the oldest one there and I do the Weber tuning and I have my huge wall of jets. Of, <laughs> so they say that's Ken's laptop. <laughs> and I even have a distributor machine. So, so I do, we do. It works, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, we, do a, we do a decent amount of uh, carbureted engines as well, stuff that a lot of L-series, dots and L-series. Um, we have a Lancia Fulvia engine we're working on, which is a funky V4 from the late 60s. Uh, so we do a lot of historic engines. We do Cosworth engine, BDAs, BDGs, which are the you know, four-valve twin cam engines from the late 60s, early 70s. So we build a decent amount of those. Some will be at Monterey. Um, yeah, it's, it's nonstop. A lot of four-cylinder engines. We don't really work on LSs or that type of stuff because there's a lot of people that do that already. So we, because our mindset at, the, at our business comes from the Cosworth days, that's the type of stuff we work on. So four-valve, uh, four multi-cylinder, or sorry, four-cylinder, multi-valve, engines um, or twin cams. We do a lot of V6 stuff as well. Um, a lot of Ford EcoBoost engines for Ford and, and uh, like Focus RS engines, Raptor V6 engines, that type of stuff. So it's, it's interesting. But um, when you, you know, any of these engines, you know, the, the basics are all the same. It's all about proper engineering, proper part selection, setting it up the clearances that you need that we've developed over time internally that may be the same as factory recommended clearances and it may not be. They may be different, they may be bigger, they may be uh, tighter, it just depends on things that we've learned over time and you know when you change this for example when you change this engine over from aluminum line cylinder bores to an iron there's there's things you need to consider so a lot of that has to do with bearing clearance or piston to cylinder wall clearance. Um, so, yeah. any other questions? Yes, sir. With those oil temperatures, what's the kind of like minimum nominal operating and then upper limit? Uh, well, to be fair, I mean, most of the, the, the newer uh, synthetics, we take it up to about 200 degrees. Before warm up? Before we, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, what we see, is, this is a great question. So we start, at, start our testing on the engine dyno when the oil reaches 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Typically, the oils are stable, clear up to about 220 degrees, and you'll see the engines start to make more power as well when the oils get hotter because there's less friction. You know how thick oil is, right? When it gets hot, it gets slipperier. So the engines make a lot more power. And I've seen, especially older engines, make as much as four to five more horsepower on properly warmed up oil. So it's, it, warm oil is not a bad thing. And if you can keep it in the 180 to 2, 200 degrees range, that's optimum for most modern synthetics. What about like trap bay upper limit, top, uh, 200 degrees in the desert? Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, 220, 230 max. I mean, I don't think it's, if you're seeing more than 230, you should probably put an oil cooler on it. Um, there's, that's probably too hot. Because oil, like water, also removes heat out of the the engine and uh, 
a lot of people don't realize that it lubricates, but it also pulls heat out of the um, heat seek out of the, the metal components. So you don't want it to get too hot either. So this would be for Chinook too. Is there any easy oil temperature sensor you can stick in the release? You should probably, is your oil pan have a fitting on it? If it no. does, yeah. Yeah, and our new hot yeah. plate, which is yeah. even a sandwich um, plate for the oil filter, has a bung in it, you know, as well. And so there's, there's a couple different places to put that in place. Yeah. You want to measure the oil temp as it goes back into the engine when it's headed for the bearings. It's the operating temp of the oil, not when it's sitting in an oil tank. I mean, yeah, you can, on a dry sump engine, you, you could measure that as well. So yeah, there's you could put a gauge on it and be good to be good to yeah, know that information. Is, you know, oil temp is the, the cold oil temp is generally our biggest problem. Yeah. yeah. Because the twin oil coolers and the nearly eight quarts of capacity in the system has. Getting it up to temperature is a big challenge. Yeah. There, are those thermostatically controlled, the oil coolers? Yeah. yeah. Well, so on the, on the stock setup, even though it does appear to be, it still bleeds through there. Mm -hmm. And therein lies part of the problem. And my yeah. oil takes forever to come up in temperature. So our hot plate resolves that, you know, but it's still something, you know, as you said earlier, mm -hmm. take the time to let the car warm up properly mm -hmm. and you'll be fine. And yeah, if you are running, you know, hot days and on the racetrack, do more frequent oil changes. Yeah, you know, that's it's, it's it's easy, cheap insurance. You know, <clears throat> if you're using good quality ester based synthetics, mm -hmm. you know, like we do Motul as well. Yeah. that stuff holds up. But like when we race, race Lotus Cup every weekend, we change your oil. Yeah, as you should. Yeah. Limitations on forced induction on the stock motor. Uh, on a completely stock engine, I would say the pistons and just the general cylinder on something like this that has you know forged piston. I mean. I think that car out there is a supercharger on it, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's so it's, part. yeah, so it yeah, should be fine. I mean, again, these pistons, so this piston setup, um, this piston would be rated at about 225 horsepower per piston. So there's plenty of headroom there for more power. There's no issues there. When you, when you rebuild the motor, do you put the stock Toyota water pump back on with a plastic impeller? Or? We do use the stock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen any, I don't know, is there, yeah. I don't yeah. think there's any issues with it. If it's a genuine Toyota part, I, I don't think I'd be concerned if it's, yeah. Well, I just want to yeah. Another, a steel impeller one you guys prefer. No. I think the plastic is fine. It's lighter, <laughs> which is fine. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, how much oil consumption would you expect from a 2ZZ with your forged pistons? Uh, does it burn a lot of no, oil? No, it's not going to burn, especially on this. So the 4032 material is, uh, there's two, so forged pistons, there's typically two types of material. There's 2618 and 4032. 2016 is or 2618 is considered, uh, you know, for higher horsepower applications. So, turbocharged, supercharged, um, and it's it's uh, you would have a little bit more oil consumption with that. 4032 is more malleable, and so it's designed for uh, more um, I don't want to say street use, but it's a quieter piston. But it still has it still will withstand. Um, any power that any of you are ever going to put at it. And that being that it, expansion rate is more um, in line with the typical road type engine, so your oil consumption won't be any, shouldn't be any worse than a standard engine at all. And in fact, I would think over time this, this engine will not have the degradation in, um, or the increase in oil consumption like a factory engine would just because the bore is more stable with the ductile iron liner. This might be more of a question for Chinook. Chinook, for those of us that do our own oil servicing, how do you purge the twin oil coolers on there, at least when you're changing oil? Coolers? You know, look, I, I don't recommend it just because the fittings at the oil cooler is what you need to, to you know, disconnect. Sure. And they tend to corrode <laughs> and freeze together and then they, you know, strip threads. Yeah. So, yes, there's going to be some old oil in your coolers and in your lines, mm -hmm. but you know, assuming you're not doing 10,000 mile oil changes, it shouldn't be an issue. 
Yeah, you know, yeah. Just don't worry. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, you know, if you really, really, you know, want to be fastidious about it, then that's how you have to. You have to empty it from there, and it's a significantly lengthier process to really purge all the oil from the system. And I don't know that there's any real benefit. You know, what Ken was saying earlier. You know, on a streetcar, engine wear, majority of engine wear, frankly, comes from the cold start. Yep. Right? And we don't realize that, but that's, that is, in fact, the, the case. Lotus actually put these <coughs> AccuSumps in some of the later cars. And AccuSumps, which they put in to fix oil starvation, ironically are useless on the track. But they work great for the cold start. Right? So, you know, you have this big tank, it's in your trunk. Another, you know, a couple of additional joints, potential failure points, but on a street car, maybe a good consideration. On track cars, we tear them on immediately because we don't feel the risk of, of them failing is worth having in place for the, frankly, lack of oil starvation prevention that it does for us yeah. on these cars. So, yeah, it, it, it's, um, oil is, is, is certainly, there's a lot of people that have a lot of opinions about oil. Um, but I, but I, I concur with, with, with Ken, a proper warm-up, you know, uh, frequent oil changes based on your usage, mm -hmm. right? On the street, honestly, you have so much oil capacity, you're really not happy. Everyone thinks we drive hard on the streets, but you don't, you, you don't compare it to track. Yeah. Right? On the track, you're at wide throttle so much longer, you're in the second cam nearly all the time. You fall out of the second cam in this you know, all the joy comes out of your drive, right? And so you got to stay up in, 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 in the second camp. Yeah. And so that's high RPM. That's heat. That's degradation, okay? That is breaking down the internals of your engine. Mm -hmm. It's breaking down the internals of your transmission, your oil, and blah, blah, blah. So you want to keep the oil fresh. And so depending on what you're doing, if you're running 100 degrees, you know, track days, absolutely, my advice, change the oil after that weekend, mm -hmm. you know? And... But on the street, yeah, 5,000 mile oil changes with a good synthetic oil, I wouldn't hesitate with that. That's yeah. perfectly acceptable with these cars. And even with Canyon use, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. We have so much oil capacity you know, in this car as opposed to the car that this engine came out of, right, with a standard wet, you know, sump that it Sure. Had. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yep. Um is notorious for not answering phone calls or emails for weeks, if not months, uh, and I consider that bad customer support. How is your support after purchase, and do you uh, offer a warranty? So, support. Um, so we'll, we're, we're there six days a week, so I don't think support's an issue. Um, warranty, I think you, Chinu can, Chinu is really our dealer for the two ZZs, so you can right. mention that, but um, our take on it is it, their track day, I mean the primary use is going to be performance, so it's not like an OE rebuild, so we'll always stand behind our workmanship, but when you get something from us, um, you know, it's been tested, it's, you have, uh, I guess we probably have 60 years of combined knowledge at our facility, so um, it's hard for us to control the environment that that engine is going to be used in. So it's hard for us to offer a, a 10 year warranty or a five year warranty or anything like that. But if you put it in and there was an issue, we would take care of it. Yeah, the way we're managing things now, I mean, we obviously, we have our standard for customer service. So you'd be buying this engine through us. Yeah. So you'll be dealing with us, which means you'll be able to reach somebody yeah, and we will respond, right? We're, we're, we've mm -hmm. been doing this longer than everyone else um, in this space and can comfortably say that our customer service is pretty much unmatched. So you wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, you know, if you wanted this engine and you had a it on your car, you know what, we're not gonna give you a warranty, okay? We just won't because we know too much about that kit and it's not something that we are gonna stand behind because we didn't develop it, we, you know, but we know this engine, right? So when you work with us, we're going to try to understand everything that you've done to your car and make the appropriate recommendation. Okay, and that may be yes, we'll give you a warranty, or if you're running that kit, we are not going to. You know, if you have a turbo Lotus, we're not going to give you a warranty. Yeah. Okay? We won't even touch it. All we will do with turbos is we'll take them off. Okay, we've been through this far too long to know. Um, kind of goes back to that 500 horsepower with 91 octane request. Yeah. It's just. <laughs> 
Yeah, you guys not know, good. Like, we, we, take, we, we have this thing we call our balanced approach to tuning, and there are limits to what you can truly achieve with these cars. That car out here has a mountain engine, which I failed to mention earlier, so thank you for, for that. Um, it's a, a recent Exige build that we're doing, and it's, a, it's got our Blade 300 kit, so that's the 300 horsepower solution. The engine will have absolutely no issue with 300 horsepower. The weak link now, it becomes the gearbox, okay? We put stronger third and fourth gears in it. You know, we, you know it's, it's been fully re rebuilt, but it's all contingent upon how well can this man heal and throw his downshifts, right? The significant amount of torque that we've now added with that blade, blade kit is gonna put a hell of a lot of stress on the gearbox. And so the engine, you know, should mm -hmm. be fine, mm -hmm. you know, but the, the gearbox now becomes, so this is the problem with tuning cars, right? You, you improve one aspect of the car and that reveals the, the next weakness, right? Which before was perfectly fine in a 190 horsepower car, the transmission is fine, assuming you don't want to go into a downshift, right? But you just, this is, this is that slippery slope we all mm -hmm. get on when it comes to tuning your cars. But that's why you can rely on, on mm -hmm. us because we're, we're gonna try to educate you, you know, through the things that we've learned through, frankly, our own mistakes, right? And we're, we're talking to thousands of customers, you know, in, over all these years. So we, we have a feel for what it mm -hmm. is that does work and what doesn't work. And there's a limit to these cars. If you really want a lot of power, there's a really bitch and viper out there that I would suggest. <laughs> or the old LMP one or two yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, you are gonna, it yeah. doesn't matter what you do to your Lotus on any straight, there are many of these modern sports cars are gonna blow you away. Yeah. Okay, but all the fun comes in the corners. You know, and how you outbreak them, the speed that you carry through the corner, you know, the, it, the feeling that you frankly get from driving the car, right? Being a part of that, you know, interaction, right? That that's really very visceral, yeah. You know, so, yeah. so just as Ken says, you know, Lotuses have never been about a lot of power, but our intention here with this engine build in particular is to deliver an engine that is balanced, it's going to be reliable, frankly, for street cars that also go to the track. You want to race the car, no problem, but we are focusing this build right now mm -hmm. on being a direct replacement for people who are frankly driving the majority of the time on the street, okay? We don't want to do anything esoteric and crazy and, and boutique and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of headaches that come with that and we didn't want to do that at this point in the game. We felt that the vast majority of people frankly want a OEM kind of, yeah. you know, swap. And even though they may have a supercharger kit on their car, you know, something that still behaves like a stock car because of... That's optimized. Yeah, it's optimized mm -hmm. for that. You know, and so that, that's philosophically where we stood when we started this yep. whole project. And, you know, we're very, very happy with, with how the car and the engine, frankly, performs. And, and Ken, you know, also alluded to this. And, and I want to just kind of reinforce the fact that the smoothness of how this engine revs, it's really hard for me to describe to you guys. You have to drive it to believe it. It's on another level. Okay, it, it, it starts to feel more like a Honda motor that's extremely, mm. very rev happy, very, very smooth. These are very subtle things, right? But you guys drive loaders for a reason. Okay, that's what this engine truly, yep. truly delivers beyond the strength and other benefits that it has. But that's that, that mm -hmm. uh, qualitative thing yeah. that you feel, yeah. I tell you, it's, it's something really special, yeah. And then uh, that goes back to, I think, really stiffening up the block with this and then the balance, balancing all of the parts. It's huge. It yeah. makes a big difference. Well, listen, guys, I see the pizza has arrived. So I think what I'd like to do is make just a couple more comments. Mm -hmm. Ken, thank you very much. Thank you. He'll be here. So grab yeah. Thank you.